Hello once again after the break. Uh, for those who are watching us online, we are in Wrocław in Kino Nowe Horyzonty, and this is the next Code Dive edition. Uh, before we will start with our next speaker, please mute your phones because we don't want any interruptions here because it's kind of disturbing to our speakers. And please also don't talk as much during the lecture because it's also very hearable and it can be a little bit uh, d disturbing. So thank you very much for this. Okay, and uh, our next speaker is Natalia Lewkow-Pankiewicz. Natalia has been working in requirements engineering for eight years. She is not only actively writing specification, but she's also contributing to Nokia mobile networks, specification standards and processes development. She will introduce us today to the basics of what the specification is and how to do it right based on the worldwide standards and real life experience from her daily work. Natalia Lewkow-Pankiewicz, the stage is yours. <laughs> Good luck. Hello everyone, thank you very much for showing up. I will be talking today about requirements engineering, about specification, considering whether it's a waste of paper or maybe a tool that can, that can help you to effectively manage your project. A few words about me. Uh, I've graduated University of Wrocław, computer science. <laughs> I have nine years of experience in Nokia. Uh, in current role, I'm a system architect uh, of one of Mo Nokia Mobile Network's specification teams, working um, on operations, administrations, and maintenance of the uh, base station containing 2, 3, 4, and 5G radio access technologies. Um, privately, I'm a house plant freak. I have probably over 500 plants. I have stopped counting at some point. I love animals. I have three cats and three, uh, two aquariums, one salt water and one fresh water. Agenda for today, for the next 45 minutes, is uh, firstly to introduce you to why this topic was selected. Then I will tell you what specification is, what is the requirement, so a bit of definitions. Then uh, who needs specification, what are the consequences of not investing in the specification, how to start writing specification for your project, what are the characteristics of a good requirement? How much the, does the specification cost? And at the end, summary, your questions and my answers. If you search the internet looking for specification memes, you won't find many, there are just few, but they are addressing the problem quite well. So let's remind this popular joke about customer expectations versus the reality of the IT project. I hope you can see it. So this is how the customer explained it, the feature, how the project leader understood it, how the analyst designed it, how the programmer wrote it, how the business consultant described it, how the project was documented in the original of this picture, but I would add here also specified, <laughs> what operations have installed, how the customer was built, how it was supported at what customer really needed. That's unfortunately the reality of many IT projects. They don't have documentation, they don't have specification, or even if they have, it's highly unpopular to use it. I remember uh, when I was a software developer for a brief moment in my career, my senior teammates told me that specification is a waste of paper. Because it's too high level, it doesn't help the developer uh, to do their job. They didn't even bother to show me where to find that specification or didn't bother to really think about what they can do to improve that situation. Perhaps develop more levels of that specification so it's more detailed and more, and more useful for them as well. Before I star start talking about specification and how to do it right, it's important to understand the difference between the specification and documentation because they are very frequently mixed. Uh, both are talking about what, uh, how the feature works, right? But specification is done at the beginning of the feature development cycle. It's really designing how the feature is going to work. And documentation is done after a piece of software is developed. Again, going back in time, uh, before I have joined 
specification team, I thought my English is not good enough to be a specification engineer because I've obviously confused uh, mistaken specification for customer documentation. While in customer documentation, it's really important uh, that the, the, uh, the language is good and, and doesn't, uh, the text doesn't contain typos, in specification, it's not that important as long as it's understandable and unambiguous. Specification is a set of requirements. Requirement is something needed or wanted that can be uh, expressed in multiple forms. All of them have a common denominator. They need to clearly state what is required from who, when, and why. I will show you three examples of forms of requirements that I'm using in my daily work. That would be user story, single line requirement, and user scenario. Uh, two first ones are quite short. You can see kind of a template here on the slide. User scenario or a use case. There is a slight difference between those two, but that's just for your overview as an example, so let's not go into the details. Uh, user scenario is describing in steps also who does what and uh, when, but in a wider context of a of particular scenario. Uh, it can be in the form of a text or a diagram. On the next slides, I will show you some examples so that you get an overview how specification can look like. Let's start from the user story. On the top of the slide, you can see a template. On the bottom, example. The red, red highlighted part is indicating the requestor of the requirement. The purple one is the actor from which something is required. Yellow part is about the requirement itself, what is required, what this actor needs to do. And the last part, why. So the justification, the rationale behind the request, behind this requirement. I have selected, I hope, universal and simple example. As a customer, I want web shop to display login option for not logged in users so that not logged in users cannot see the web shop content. If you have ever used Zalando Lounge, this is how it works. You need to first register and log in before you can see what is in the web shop, in, in the web store. Uh, or, or by anything, right? That's the first example. Uh, the same requirement in the form of a single line requirement could look like this. When a new web shop HTTP session is started by not logged in user, web shop shall display login option. You may notice that this rational part is missing. So it's nice to have it, uh, and it's nice to add it as a note, aside of the requirement, to explain why something was designed in a certain way. After some time, you will not remember, <laughs> in all the cases, why something was designed this way. Sometimes, not in this case, it could be some hardware uh, constraint that you are forcing you to design something in a certain way. Sometimes it could be just a temporary software limitation because you want to save efforts. And in the future, you can improve the functionality, you can improve your design. So it's good to have, have, have this note. All right, you may also ask why this strange shawl is used here. Shawl is not only a word here, it's an icon. It is screaming that, hey, this is a requirement. It has exactly the same meaning as must, but somehow sound, sounds stronger, right? Uh, so uh, one of the mistakes I have seen is that instead of shall, people are using should, may, needs to, and, and those are not binding. Shall or must are binding. They are made for uh, writing requirements. Uh, also a trap is to use will. Uh, sometimes people, when writing requirements, think about how it will be designed in the future and use will. But at the moment of the, of the requirement verification, it needs to be stating the current state. The, it must be about the presence. All right, and here, the example of user scenario, quite longish, but the scenario is very simple. It contains certain sections. You can see a template on the left-hand side and the example on the right-hand side. User scenario is about webshop first launch. It has a description uh, that is explaining the background uh, of, the, of the user story and describing what the user story is about. 
Um, it can refer to other related requirements, uh, give, give some background information. For example, this user scenario describes first launch of webshop application. For logged in user uh, webshop launch, please see user scenario number two. Next part, actors. Uh, those could be passive actors, like uh, those th that um, interact with your system, like uh, user, web browser, and, and your part of your system, actors from inside of your system, like webshop. Uh, all, all the parties that are playing a role in the scenario. Then the preconditions. Um, those are assumptions you make before the scenario starts. User is logged out or never logged in. Triggers. Those are states or actions, one or more, that, that could trigger this scenario. Uh, for example, user opens web browser and types in URL of the web shop. It's kind of step zero of the main flow, the triggers, right? And then main flow is a list of single line requirements or steps that are um, expected from other actors that you cannot set requirements towards, like user or uh, web browser, that you expect as reaction of, uh, to, to actions of your system. Step one could be that webshop shall detect not logged in user. Step two, webshop shall display login window. And in this simple scenario, that would be probably all. Post conditions, uh, the state, observable state of the system after the scenario is executed. User cannot use webshop with without logging in. And then don't forget about exceptions. Uh, that explain what can go wrong in each of the steps of the scenario and how system reacts to that. Here is more or less the same thing in the form of a diagram. So I think it looks more appealing, right? So the general recommendation would be that perhaps it's better to use diagrams whenever you can than a, a text. On the right hand side, you can see plant UML code that was used to generate this diagram. So maybe for programmers, that would be also some, something nice that, uh, that writing specification could look a bit like programming, right? OK, so you already uh, know what is specification, how it can look like, what the requirement is not. Requirement is not implementation, because no specific software design must be derived from the requirements. There can be multiple options how this can be implemented. Requirement tell what is required, not how to do this, uh, leaving some, uh, some room for the developer's creativity. Requirement is not a general story, uh, information about the background and history of the function. Of course, it is useful, like a rationale in the single line requirement or a description in the user scenario to give some background, but it needs to be clearly separated uh, from the requirements themselves so that no requirement is mi missed in the esoteric description. Requirement is also not a test case. It must be verifiable, but single requirement could translate to multiple test cases. It's up to the test engineer to design test plan based on the requirements. Let's see who are the customers of the specification teams. Who needs specification? First of all, product managers, project managers, business analysts. This role is called different in different companies, but I mean here the people from the project who have direct contact with the customer, who are collecting the requirements from the customer. They need to be able to check up to a certain level of detail how the feature is going to work, if it's going to deliver what they have promised to the customer. Developers. They need to plan the implementation based on the requirements to be sure that they deliver what customer wanted. Testers, they need to verify if the developed feature fulfills the requirements. Customer documentation, so those guys who are writing the user manuals for, for, for the end user, they need an input to describe to the customer how the feature works. In Nokia, some of the customer documentation teams actually have 
access to the test environment. So they take specifications and input, they can execute the user scenario on their own and see how it works and then reli reliably describe it uh, to the end users in customer documentation. And at the end, specification teams themselves. Those are most frequent users of the specification. Uh, specification teams need to have a database uh, to assure that new features are not breaking any existing design, uh, to be able to track dependencies between functionalities, and to be able to quickly find requirements and refer to them in the discussions. Let's think what are the consequences of not investing in the specification of the system. Some may think that specification is some, some kind of burden, something that needs to be kept up to date. But if you don't have any specification, you can run into multiple troubles, actually. First of all, it's difficult to remember everything. So when you don't have specification, you can only rely on what people think that things should work like. It's difficult to estimate scopes and schedules. You don't have a way to measure the size of the feature. Uh, there is a higher risk of omissions, misunderstandings, inconsistencies, causing the need of uh, redesigning, recoding, and retesting, which costs and causes, of course, project delay. There is higher risk of spending time on work that doesn't serve the end user. There is also no translation layer between the standard and the project world. If you ever try to read FreeGPP or ORAN standards, uh, they are huge amount of documents uh, written in a way that is difficult to read, using very general terms that are universal for all the companies. And someone needs to actually go through this and translate it to the project terms. That's not the end. It's also difficult to transfer to the project to new users, machines, or development teams. If you don't have specification, there is high probability that you will be wasting time for the same discussions over and over again because you don't have any ready agreement on the paper. And don't get me wrong, questioning the design is a good thing in principle, but going in circles, discussing same things over and over again, that's a waste. It's also difficult to let the experts leave the project. That's always difficult, but as a project leader, Without specification, you are kind of kept hostage because all the most precious knowledge is only in the people's heads, not written down anywhere. It's also difficult to on onboard newcomers to the project. Uh, since the specification is updated with each new feature, it is usually up to date. So it's a great source of knowledge to onboard new people to the project. Are you scared enough now? <laughs> is, are those problems really serious and you are considering now starting writing specification for your project. If yes, then I have prepared a recipe in five simple steps how to prepare the background for writing specification. So where do you start? First, set the boundaries of the system under specification. Decide what will be specified. Here it's a totally random system and, and uh, just draw the system from your area and decide what parts of the system uh, are in your control, meaning that your company is uh, de de delivering that product or you are ordering it from the subcontractor and you have agreed that you can set some requirements towards them. Clearly identify the external interfaces of your system in this blue rectangle. Uh, define the, the interfaces towards neighboring systems, define who are the users of your system. Step number two, divide the system to functional hardware and software layers. Sounds scary, but it's actually, the procedure is very simple. Look at your system and think, what is your black box system called? Look at it from the perspective of the functionality of the hardware and of the software system. That biggest black box, or perhaps few black boxes, would be your layer number one. Then look, uh, try to open that box and see what smaller black boxes you have inside. That would be your layer number two. And you repeat that process as long as you can. That would be 
the horizontal split. And vertical split would be within all those layers to functional domains like uh, you may have aspects related to the security of the system, aspects related to upgradability of your system, and, and those can be handled in parallel by different teams, perhaps. Why do you need those layers? In short, to translate the architecture of your system to practical feature development process in your company, to your organization. Uh, if system is complex, there can be many people in various roles involved in the feature development process. There would be people closer to the customer, like on the left-hand side of the picture, that are mainly interested in the externally visible design, how the end user will see that system, and they don't necessarily need to know all the details how it will be coded inside. On the other hand, you have experts that, that need to implement a particular algorithm, and they need to know those details uh, to be able to deliver their work. Don't try to specify everything at once. This division to layers, those all sizes of black boxes, are um, for you to realize how complex your, is your system and how many of those layers do you need and how will you translate it to stages of the feature development. Because it's technically not possible for everyone to know everything. The composition of the system to layers uh, of abstraction mm, is needed because people who are participating the specification at given stage needs to understand uh, what is written there, right? So let's look uh, from the perspective of the product manager. He needs our customer documentation. They need to know how the feature will work on the very high level. And developers, of course, need, need to someone to translate this very high level picture for them to more detailed design to be aware what they need to deliver. So, uh, more about it also in the step four, but now step number three, decide about common terminology to be used. It's a good idea to start from the standards. Call things in the same way as they are called in the standards. Create a glossary. Define the terminology, define how each of those black boxes is called, and use that terminology consistency across your uh, project, both in customer documentation, in specification, and in uh, internal software architecture design. People communicate better if they speak the same language, right? Step number four, decide how particular system layers discovered in step two uh, translate to the feature development stages. Uh, here is the V-model depicting the feature development cycle. On the top, you can see layer one, two, so the biggest black boxes and the smallest black boxes on the bottom. There is no universal recipe how to do this. It all depends on your project of uh, how many layers do you have. You need to look at your team and decide what, how many layers, how many sizes of black boxes fit into the one level of specification and one corresponding level of verification. It may be so, like on this example, that three highest levels translate to one specification level, but it can be also that one layer would, would translate to one specification, one verification layer. Okay. Going back to specification examples so that you understand this difference between the levels of specification. Uh, here is this high level specification level one example that I have already shown. Single line requirement when a new web shop HTTP session is uh, started by not logged in user, web shop shall display login option. How this requirement could be decomposed to a more detailed specification on the level two. For instance, this way. When a new webshop HTTP session is started, a webshop backend, new actor, more detailed, not visible to the end user directly, shall detect if the user is not logged in. And requirement number two. Uh, when a webshop backend detects not logged in user, webshop frontend, also new actor, shall display login banner. And login banner would be also something internal uh, defined in your glossary. That is not, uh, oh, the end user doesn't know that you call it this way, but for your project it could have some meaning, right? 
And step five, maybe least important, but worth to mention, uh, find the tools for specification storage. There are plenty of specification tools available on the market. The ones I have used are Magic Draw, IBM Doors, um, Sphinx. Uh, I don't want to comment <laughs> any of them or compare list pros and cons. Um, there is one general lesson I have learned from using any specification tools. Tool needs to be easily accessible and browsable by people without any special training, without installing any special tools, uh, going through hours of, of manuals. Otherwise, nobody will use it. In Nokia, it works best if you have some user interface in the web application that allows you uh, to search some keywords and based on that find a piece of specification related to that keyword. So then, really, I have seen that even developers are looking into specification and using it. Uh, when you start writing specification, you can start even using a typing machine and store it in an analog way, <laughs> like on the picture. Um, you can use Microsoft Office, doesn't matter. But with time, uh, when your specification grows, you may decide to use some tools that would allow you um, for for using those features like versioning system, parametrization. So instead of having five exactly similar requirements for different types of hardware or uh, software release or, or element of the system, you could have just one, use some variable in the text of the requirement and have an attribute that is listing all the system elements to which this requirement applies. So then you have just one requirement that is uh, specifying kind of many uh, fragments of the system. Uh, sorry, linking. Uh, so it's very useful when you read a requirement and it refers to another that you can just click the link and it moves you there. Uh, and of course, search function. Those are useful features that uh, documentation or specification tools offer. All right, uh, what are the, the characteristics of a good requirement? When you have went through those five preparation steps, you are ready to start writing specification, what should you pay attention to? Uh, here is a set of, of those characteristics that are worth to consider. Those are just recommendations, so there is no guarantee that if you stick to those uh, recommendations, your specification will be perfect, and also, uh, if, if you don't fulfill any of them, it doesn't mean that your specification, specification is useless. But this is based actually on the IEEE standard from 1998. Previous version was from 1993, so this standard is quite stable. <laughs> so you can trust it, more or less, uh, that it really is used in the, in the industry. Let's see one by one what those characteristics mean. Unitary or atomic. Requirement... Uh, Unitary or atomic um, means that requirement addresses only one thing, doesn't contain conjunctions. This way, it's very simple, it can be uh, easily implemented and verified. But of course, there is this disadvantage that if you try writing very atomic requirements, the amount of requirements will grow and perhaps your database won't be readable, searchable by the human being. Next characteristic is correct. Correct means that requirement expresses what is needed. And how do you know it's correct? You need to go to the person who has re requested the feature and check with that person. Review the requirement with that request originator to be sure that it expresses exactly what was needed. Unambiguous. It means that to the possible extent, the requirement has only one interpretation. When requirements are written in the natural language, it's difficult to have them uh, unambiguous uh, because the natural language is ambiguous itself, right? One hint is to use as simple language as possible, then you increase the chance that the requirements will be understandable by the multinational community you are working in. Complete. For a single requirement, complete means that uh, the requirement is answering all the questions. Who needs to do what, when and why. Uh, so it has a complete structure. 
uh, for a set of requirements, complete would mean that uh, your set of requirements is covering all the functional and non-functional requirements, exceptions, glossary, addresses everything that is needed. Consistent. Consistent characteristic of a requirement means that there are no contradictions between requirements, between requirements on the same level or between different levels of requirements. Verifiable. Verifiable means that um, it can be verified, that it uses well-defined well terms that can be measured or checked. Imagine right, uh, trying to verify a requirement that is referring to following terms. Never, always, too low, too high, user-friendly, works well, normally, <laughs> minimize, maximize, etc. I don't know how I would verify that, so try to avoid them. When writing specifications, think how it will be verified. It's also a good idea to invite test engineer to verify, to review your requirement and assure that it is verifiable. Modifiable. It means that requirement is generic in structure, it's easy to extend it, and it's easy to port it to new, for instance, new hardware platforms. Um, one example of not modifiable requirement would be a requirement that contains a table that is pasted in the form of a picture. Then <laughs> you need to redo the entire table in order to change any cell in that table or add any rows or columns. So try to using modifiable, extendable objects instead of screenshots pasted in the requirements. Traceable. Traceable means that the origin uh, rationale of the requirement is known. Uh, for downstream requirements, it would mean that they have a reference to the upstream requirement from which they have been derived. Okay, so instinctively, when you start writing specification, you will start from functional requirements, uh, but don't forget about non-functional ones. Uh, Non-functional requirements help to judge the quality of the system rather than uh, how the system works. Uh, for example, you can have performance requirements. How long does it take for the system to perform certain operation or the mass amount of operations? Uh, system capacity requirements. How many operations or users the system is able to serve or how much hardware resources it requires to be deployed. System reliability, availability, resiliency. Uh, for example, what are the acceptable service breaks? It's typically very difficult to write non-functional requirements upfront before you have actual test results. Last question, is the specification costly? And my answer is no, it is actually quite cheap. Uh, when I have looked for the statistics in Nokia, uh, in, in the project I'm working in, of the entire feature development effort spent this year, uh, specification was like 10% of the entire effort. And remember that it is <laughs> amortized by all the costs that you would uh, need to pay for, for reworking your solutions if you have any omissions, misunderstandings, and so on. So I think it pays off. Let's summarize now. Uh, specification is not a waste of paper if it's well thought, easily accessible, and follows good requirement characteristics. All of that makes it useful. Specification is not so costly and brings multiple benefits or at least increases probability that you will fall into some serious troubles. Decreases the probability of falling into troubles. And uh, also requirements engineering is an interesting and challenging career path that is frequently underestimated. Uh, on the uni technical universities, there are no courses typically about requirements engineering. Uh, on the universities that where, mm, where programmers are teached. Uh, so I, I thought it would be interesting to mention this topic on Code Dive. I didn't see it on the, any of the previous editions. So I took this opportunity to just bring it to you and, and maybe it's something worth to consider as a career path. Um, it is interesting because uh, it's really creative. You need to constantly learn 
about new technologies. You need to have both technical and soft skills to be able to work uh, with all the people involved in the feature development process to build a circle around you, because at the end, the specification, the design of the features is not one man job, it's a teamwork. Um, in my team, I have experts from various backgrounds. There are people who previously were software developers, like I was, uh, people with background from testing, from customer support, from, uh, from product management. All those experiences give us a bit different point of view on the problems and help to design features the best way we can. Uh, all right, so wherever you are on your career path, uh, whether you are still studying and maybe already not feeling thrilled about uh, coding for the rest of your life, then maybe it's a nice alternative for you to consider. Or maybe developer work is your true dream, but you still have many of years of work ahead and maybe you will change your mind. That's all I have prepared for you. Thank you for listening. And now, time for your questions. If you uh -oh, have any questions, question. please. <laughs> OK, yes, good, <laughs> perfect. Hello. What is uh, Wondar, Nokia. Uh, at, at the beginning, you described the different types of uh, requirements. Uh, and uh, But actually, there is no rule that uh, in your project you, you should use all of them at once, yes? Uh, yeah. And my question is, uh, what, rec uh, what requirements type are the most convenient and the most frequently used for the di different uh, groups of uh, users? from the customers on the one side and for, uh, to, for the development teams on the other. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the most convenient way is, is diagrams. Uh, it depends on the complexity of, of your project. If the project is very simple, then it would be easier perhaps to write those single line requirements, short requirements that would uh, list all the functionalities that your system elements will uh, are required to fulfill. But if the system is complex, the best way to see how all those actors interact is uh, using user scenario. And in my daily work, I, I work in the highest level specification. I use mostly user scenarios. Any other questions? If not, then I have a question for you. <laughs> how many of you have specification in your project? Oh, wow, that's quite many. I'm surprised. Good job. <laughs> Keep doing it. Thank you. OK. Guess OK, that's thank you, Natalia, once again. <laughs> thank you very much. We have a gift for you. Thank you. <laughs> of course.